never going to get old with you, is it? I love our theme. <laughs> I am happy with it. It, it. it has a good, it's a good timeless theme. I like it. And it's it's jazzy, 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 jazzy. Uh, it, which, by the way, uh, we just lost one of the jazz greats, Chick Corea. Chick Corea. Yep. Very, very sad news. Uh, he was fighting a very rare form of cancer. I got to meet Chick Corea mm. years ago. I was at Dragon Con, and he was playing in the hotel where they were having Dragon Con, and he had just finished. And my friend Donna Maloney, shout out to Donna Maloney, she was a huge Chick Corea fan, and she was so upset that she didn't get to see him. She didn't even know he was playing there. And I took her, we snuck into the ballroom where he was playing, and we snuck backstage, and we met Chick Corea. Chick Corea it, got booked at Dragon Con? No, 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 no. It was, uh, well, yeah, I think it might have been part of Dragon Con, but wow, it was in the same hotel. She didn't know he was there until after it would, the show had already ended. So she was really upset because she thought she missed him. And then I took her in there and very stealthily, like we snuck backstage and I said, I just kept telling her, I'm like, come on, come on, let's go. And she was like, no, 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 I don't want to go. And I, but we ended up getting to meet him and like, there was nobody else around. So we got to have like a little private meeting with Chick Corea and he was super nice, like super cool guy. So for somebody who basically made his bones as a part of, um, of Miles Davis's crew, he was so laid back and down to earth, just yeah. insanely, insanely cool. Very uh, un underappreciated. Yeah. Saw him at Caravan of Dreams in Fort Worth uh, three times. Yeah. Yeah. But just a, an amazing performer. And, you know, along that long list of... See, January is just so bad for Brutal. celebrity passings. It's, yeah. it al it's always bad, but it just feels worse this year, and I don't know why. Well, it's and it's bleeding into February. It's like we thought maybe like January was going to get a bunch of it out of the way, but it just keeps bleeding into February. It's like, God, stop taking the people we love. It's been really rough. So and we're left with Justin Bieber. Kids, that's Mark Walters. That's Devin Pike. Wait, that's Devin, that's Devin Pike? That's it, Devin Pike. That's I've been Devin in the Pike. same place the, that's entire, Devin Pike. the entire show. You just... I it astounds me that you can't point in one direction. That's it. That's, That's Devin Pike. Oh God! Welcome to the Friday Wrap Party, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching slash listening slash subscribing. Once again, if you're just joining us on the Big Film Show, thank you. We hope that you subscribe to our show either via audio podcast at bigfilmshow.com or over on YouTube on the Big Film Show channel. Yeah, and you can find us all over the place, and, and I think it's just Big Film Show everywhere you go, right? Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook, whatever. So yeah. in, anything, any popular social site followed by Big Film Show. If you want to send us an email, you can email us at hey at bigfilmshow.com, and we'd love to hear from you guys. Read some of your notes on the air. Coming up later today on The Wrap Party, Disney continues its absolute dominance over every single part of your life. Two of the people who we like in pop culture aren't exactly the people we thought they were, and a long gestating project might actually be coming to a television set near you. But we're going to start off. Lies. <laughs> but is it true? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Hey, you're by, the one that started it, pal. By the, by the way, I am at some point going to clean this up back here, just so everybody knows I'm, I'm working on it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Room Raider gave you like a, a two out of ten. <laughs> we'll start with the, uh, the continuance in the awards season, the strangest one on record, with Mark and the Dallas-Fort Worth Film Critics Association. Yes, yeah, so as uh, some of you may have heard, or if you some of you may already know, I am a member of the DFW Film Critics Association, and we do voting every year for uh, the films that we want to win in the Oscars or get awards show attention and whatnot. We just turned in our votes earlier this week, and uh, wow, we had a pretty big, pretty quick turnaround on that. We actually got the results like a day or so later, and so I'm going to read you guys the results of the Dallas Fort Worth Film Critics Association Awards this year. Uh, the pick, these are basically the films that we picked in the order that we picked them for who we, you know, think is going to win. Uh, and all of this is then submitted and, uh, you know, like all the major studios and everything get copies of this as well. But now wait a second, hang on. This isn't what you think is going to win the Oscars. These are your own awards. This isn't any indicator for anything else other than what you felt were the best films of the year, yeah? Well, no, we submit this as a group. So, I mm -hmm. mean, the, the, the results are submitted as a group, 
But what I'm reading you is basically how the group shows these films, and I'm reading it to you in the order that it was sent in. So uh, it's still going to be mixed in with a lot of other, you know, film critic association ballots and things like that. So it's basically like it's a drop in the pond, if you will. But it, but it, you know, it could affect potentially, you know, how the outcome happens. So Fair I'm just enough. letting I'm just letting you know what the DFW Film Critic Association chose. This does not reflect in any way what other, you know, outlets, other cities, major cities, and other film critic associations choose. So just because we pick this does not necessarily mean this is what you're going to see. It could be radically different when you see the actual results that come out for Oscar nominations and things like that. So anyway, with, without further ado, let's get right into it. So for Best Picture, uh, DFW Film Critics Association chose Nomadland, the Chloe Zhao film which we've talked about a little bit on here and you'll be hearing a lot more about it because I believe it officially, uh, the official release is this week. I think it's tomorrow or, or, or no, it's Friday of this week. Yes. Friday of this week. So you'll finally get a chance to see this film. This is a wonderful movie. I'm very, very happy this was chosen. It was not my number one. It was not my personal number one, but I'm extremely happy that it got the number one spot. The runners up in order were Promising Young Woman, The Trial of the Chicago 7, Minari, One Night in Miami, Mank, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Sound of Metal, Defy Bloods, and First Cow. Uh, for Best Actor, we have uh, our winner was Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. It'll be very interesting to see if Chadwick Boseman ends up taking home a posthumous award this year. Uh, and a lot of people seem to think that is going to happen. So not just us. Uh, the runners-up were Riz Ahmed for Sound of Metal, Gary Oldman for Mank, Delroy Lindo for Defy Bloods. Delroy Lindo, where's he been? Uh, Anthony Hopkins for The Father, in that order. Best Actress, our winner. This should come as no surprise if you guys have been paying attention to what a lot of people have been talking about. Carrie Mulligan for Promising Young Woman. Fantastic performance. And absolutely my personal number one pick as well. Runners-up were Francis McMormon for Nomadland, Viola Davis for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Vanessa Kirby for Pieces of a Woman, and Andra Day for The United States versus Billie Holiday. A very late entry into the awards, uh, and a lot of people still have not seen that film. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of attention that does get from the Academy. Best Supporting Actor, winner Daniel Kaluuya for Judas and the Black Messiah. That should also come as no surprise to a lot of people. Leslie Odom, runners up include Leslie Odom Jr. for One Night in Miami, Sasha Baron Cohen for The Trial of the Chicago Seven, Bill Murray for On the Rocks, another film that kind of got sort of forgotten a little bit because it came out a lot earlier. Uh, Paul Rudd, or I'm sorry, Paul, Paul Rudd, Paul Rassi, I think it's Rassi for Sound of Metal, a phenomenal performance, by the way, in that. Uh, Best Supporting Actress winner is Amanda Seyfried from Mank. Uh, the runners up in order are. Yoon Yu Jing, or I'm sorry, Yu Yu Jung, I believe is how you say it. it it's spelled Y U H J U N G. So Yu Jung, I believe is how you say that. For Minari, who is terrific. Uh, Helena Zingel for News of the World. Maria Bak Bakalova for Borat, subsequent movie film. <laughs> and Olivia Coleman for The Father. Best director, the winner was Chloe Zhao for Nomad Land. Very excited to see that. Uh, and I cannot wait to see her next film, which is Marvel's Eternals. That's going to be phenomenal. Also coming out this year. Runners up in order were Emerald Fennell for A Promising Young Woman, Regina King, I love Regina King, for One Night in Miami, David Fincher for Mank, and Aaron Sorkin for The Trial of the Chicago 7. Best All right, so great, yeah. great list overall. I mean, sincerely, I mean, it, it, a lot of what we've, what we've been talking about over the last month everyone else in the Critics Association seems to have agreed with on the most part of it. I'm a little interested in hearing why Leslie Odom Jr. was the pick out of all four of the folks from One Night in Miami. So my theory of that is, I think, because... I think recognition for Hamilton? No, I well, I think it's partly that. I think it's also that he is probably the most recognizable actor out of that group. Uh, and let's face it, when it comes to voting, whether it's entertainment or politicians, people have a tendency to gravitate towards the names that they recognize, even if they don't necessarily 
even when it comes to politicians, even if they don't necessarily know their policies, they still tend to gravitate towards the names they recognize. So I think that probably is the answer to your question, but I definitely think the Hamilton angle plays into that as well. What was the biggest surprise for you out of, out of these awards? Um, geez. Either somebody who won up on top or somebody who was not on the list whatsoever. Uh, I was happy to see that Minari was sh was getting some love because I thought that it deserved it. Uh, I mm, wow, that's a that's such a good question. I think um, you can think about it and come back to it. I just I, yeah, it's the one thing that I, I mean because I'm still I'm I'm still getting my legs back into I, I, the review I community. A, I have an answer for you. I okay. think I think. And I had it on my list. Like, I had various awards nominated for it on my list. But to see the amount of love that Mank is getting, because as much as I love David Fincher, and as much as I think that is an impressive film, I didn't love it. And yet, it seems to be popping up on a lot of critics' lists. And I have to think that it's because the aesthetic of the film, the look of the film, everything about the film, it's very artsy. It's very, it's very early Hollywood artsy. And I think that because of that, uh, people are looking at it and they're thinking, well, this, this, this has to be an awards worthy type of production because it's got all those things in it. So that's the one I think that kind of surprises me that it's getting as much love as it is. Uh, I had it very low on like, it, I did have it nominated for best picture. I will admit that but it was very low. I think it might've even been on the bottom of my list. So um, I just think there were a lot of better films. Um, I did want to mention this real quick. Uh, just a couple, there was a couple categories we kind of glossed over best foreign film Minari. No surprise. Uh, best documentary was our, the winner for the group was time. Um, my, I actually had Belushi on there. Nobody had Belushi on there from what I could tell. Best animated film was soul. No surprise there. Although please do not overlook wolf walkers. Um, Love best, Wolf Walker so much. Best screenplay, uh, and this is where I think Promising Young Woman really has a shot. Promising Young Woman by Emerald Fennell. I have a feeling this is going to sweep all the best screenplay awards. I think a lot of those award shows are going to end up giving it to Promising Young Woman. Uh, the runner-up was Aaron Sorkin for Trial of Chicago 7. You know what? That guy's got enough, okay? <laughs> uh, best cinematography was... <laughs> Best cinematography was Joshua James Richards for Nomadland. I don't disagree with that. Uh, best musical score, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross from Mank. That was my favorite thing about Mank was the, the score, the film score. And then the Russell Smith Award, which is kind of an award that we nominate for the best low-budget or cutting-edge independent film, was Minari. Uh, so that's that's the whole list. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly... There weren't a lot of what I would call surprises, um, and and did was you know I think you had asked if there was anything that got left off that I had mm -hmm. wished had gotten on there, like Birds of Prey. No, not Birds of Prey. <laughs> I I just justice wished, for Kathy Yan. I just wish that one night in Miami was getting more love because I feel like it really deserves it. I mean, it is on there in multiple categories, but. I wish it was at the top of those categories a little bit more because I really did think that was a phenomenal film. Well, Judas and the Black Messiah as well. I mean, yes. Shaka King got love in the director's category. Regina King got love in the director's category for One Night in Miami. And uh, Daniel Kalula, obviously uh, up and coming actor. He's getting a lot of amazing roles and he's only going to get more as time goes on. That's you just mentioned something that okay, this would be my shock, and that was that Shaka King was not. Uh, oh, I thought he the, was, I thought he made the top no, five in that list. No, we had oh, Chloe, we, okay, we had Chloe Zhao for Nomad Land as the winner, Emerald Fennell, Regina King, David Fincher, and Aaron Sorkin as the runner ups. To not see Shaka King's name in there was really disappointing because I absolutely had him on my ballot. Uh, I'm a little surprised he's not on. Uh, I think he's maybe just too new of a name for people. I think that maybe when people see, because God, that film is really impressive. And I think that if this is to be just his freshman effort, you know, for, for or many more or sophomore effort for many more films to come, uh, I, I think we'll be seeing his name a lot more in these types of lists because it, it is a phenomenal film. I, I was talking to our friend, James Faust, who we're going to have, I think on a future show. Yes. Ne next Friday. Yeah, James Strauss from the Dallas International Film Festival. And I said, 
I felt like Shaka King's work on uh, this film, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, was Scorsese level great. I mean, it is, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And I think he's got a very bright future ahead of him. Well, we're going to be discussing, I mean, we're kind of getting away from our, um, our stated goal of sticking with either the classics or new stuff as time goes on. But uh, next week, since, um, since we've got a, a chance to see Nomadland and Minari this weekend, we'll be talking about those on our Tuesday episode. Then uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, we've got Slater for the 23rd, and Mank on March the 2nd. As we start getting into the Oscar season and able to, you know, make educated uh, opinions about this because... I mean, it's easy to say that, well, you know, uh, Daniel Kalula or uh, even Chadwick Boseman, it's easy to say that they turn on great performances. You mm -hmm. have to actually see them. And oh, know, absolutely. It, it, it makes you, if you're filling out that Oscar ballot for the pool, it gives you a better weighted piece of it. So, yeah. And I think some of the films that ended up maybe not getting as much love this time around. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, I think it was because they came out pretty early, you know, films like On the Rocks, the Sofia Coppola film, or To Five Bloods, you know, which which also didn't seem to get as much attention as we thought it would, but that was a film that came out very early in the running. So a lot of the films we're seeing are films that just hit within the last month, and that's not abnormal for award nominations, but in this particular case, I do feel like maybe there's a couple that are getting overlooked there. So, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Can I just say that On the Rocks was so disappointing and really not a good flick for me at all? It's It was kind of bland. Uh, I liked Murray in it. I thought Bill Murray did a great job, but, I mean, he's great in everything. I could watch yeah, Bill Murray. I could watch Bill Murray, like, set the dinner table as long as he was talking, you know. But, see, it just proves the, that Lost in Translation was a one-off because <laughs> Sophia Cope, everything else that Sophia Coppola has directed, God, it just it just kicks me in the pancreas every time. I, I just, I, I, just because your last name's Coppola, sweetie, just, just, just uh. did you think, do you think that this one was particularly challenging for audiences because there was the expectation of, Oh, look, it's Sophia Coppola with Bill Murray again. This is 100%. their big, their big follow-up to lost in translation and lost in translation was so good. There was no way this film was going to ever live up to it. And even the marketing, you know, even though it took great pains to tell you that this has nothing to do with Lost in Translation whatsoever. Right. And even, even with that, you're still in the back of your head going, there's got to be some magic here. There has to be. And it just, it, it left me so flat. Anyway, that's my micro review of On the Rocks. <laughs> no, just no. <laughs> I wanted to like it more than I did. I will admit that. One of the films that was actually supposed to be at South by Southwest 2020 was on the rocks, and I'm using that as a segue. I'm, we're working on segues. Nice segue. Stinger. Thank you. I like that. Nice. So, obviously, South by Southwest 2020 was the canary in the coal mine for things getting shut down due to the pandemic. We're still in that, we're still in that mindset now, and uh, just this week, we found out how South by Southwest 2021 film is going to be handled. 100% virtually. Um, they, they could have gone the route that Sundance went with some satellite screens, but instead you can purchase a pass that'll get you into all of the films and all of the symposiums for $249 and watch them all along with all of the press and everyone else in the pass holders while it's happening. I looked into this because uh, Janet Pearson, who runs South by Southwest Film, uh, for decades, one of the most innovative and phenomenal festival programmers in the world. She she knows more about film than any of us will ever, ever forget. Just a phenomenal programmer. She had the Herculean task of taking all of the films for South by Southwest 2021 and making a concerted decision to not only putting them on virtually, but it still has that kind of exclusive feel to it because there's a certain amount of seats for each film and once those seats are filled up you can't get in it'll still be available throughout the rest of the event but it, it's still it's it, it, you still have that gatekeeper thing they also announced their full slate of um films this year they have 
75 features total in the program, 57 world premieres, three international premieres, and they're all available to the press and the public. The opening night screening is I'm Fine, Thanks for Asking with, uh, uh, let's see, where's that cast list? Da -da -da. Kelly Cal, Wesley Moss, and Dion Cole. When a recently widowed mother becomes houseless, she convinces her eight-year-old daughter that they're only camping for fun while working to get them off the streets. That's your opening uh, world premiere feature. Um, Who's the director on that? The director is Kelly Cowley and Angelique Molina. Oh, nice. Okay. Who also uh, co-wrote it with Roma Kong for that. Uh, let's see. That is not the opening night film. That was a completely screwed up page. So opening night film is the Demi Lovato documentary Dancing with the Devil. Um, again, a world premiere. And it's the aftermath of um, her meteoric rise to stardom, almost dying from an overdose in 2018, and her um, awakenings in the future. Uh, the closing night film is Alone Together, uh, directed by Bradley Bell and Pablo Jones Solar. And it follows Charlie XCX. I don't think that's 10C10. No, not. it's XCX. It is XCX. She's yeah. a pop star in quarantine and embarks on a whirlwind creative and romantic journey while making an album in 40 days. And the centerpiece film for South by Southwest 2021. I cannot wait to see this. And this, I'm, this might actually be worth plucking down the pass in itself. Tom Petty, Somewhere You Feel Free, directed by Mary Wharton. It has a newly discovered archive of 16 millimeter film showing uh, Petty on his work on Wildflowers, which many consider to be his greatest album ever. And it's a very intimate look at the late musical icon. So South by Southwest 2021 goes XX. SXSW.com. I, I, I look at it and I say South by Southwest or just South by. I, that's the way I even look at it. Uh, .com to purchase your pass, get the full details on the entire slate of films over on South by and be a part of it. So I think we need to apply for press for that, Mark. Yeah, 57 world premieres. My God. And I love the limited seating aspect of it. I think that's great. Uh, this, this may be, um, we may be looking at the future of a lot of film festivals with this. Uh, we need to pay really close attention to how this goes. I'm curious. Yeah. Not only that, but, um, if smaller festivals can take on this role, how do they stay local with a digital footprint? That's going to be something I'm really curious to see. Oak Cliff Film Festival did it to a, a certain degree, but they are still feeling their way through it. I think uh, Barack and uh, Jason are going to, you know, really hammer things out for the <laughs> festival in June and see how that goes as well. But yeah, a lot of people are going to be taking a look at what South by does this year. And for an extra $20, you can have a homeless Austinite come to your house and beg for money. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's actually Mark, and it's only $20. It's, yeah, so I'll do it for five, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I actually, you know, it's funny. I haven't been to South by Southwest in a few years, and I really miss it because I miss kind of the thing that's so great about South by Southwest is that you really do get the sense, and, and of course, I only ever went for the film portion of it, but you really do get the sense when you get there that you are surrounded by film lovers. You are surrounded by people who truly respect and, and appreciate film. Like these are not people that are just trying to sneak their way into a new movie. These are people that really love film. And and I, like you and I both had had experiences where, you know, we would make instant friends with people that we, you know, we had no connection with them. We had never met them before, but we would just sit down at a table to work on our computer. And the next thing you know, you've made a lifelong friend. Uh, and that's friends not, that we still have to this day, both yeah. of us. Yeah, people like Todd Gilchrist and people who, you know, we 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 love these people. And, and I mean, we never would have met them had it not been for South by Southwest. So I really miss that festival. I'm excited to kind of check out the online version of it. And I think this year is going to be really exciting. There are things I'm going to miss about not being in Austin for South by. Yeah. And the, the last time you and I covered this festival together, it was the end. It was uh, the last season of Lost. And we were trying to watch Lost, and then we were going to go into town. And then both of our phones start blowing up because Bill Murray, who was in town for, <laughs> uh, oh, God, it's Robert Duvall and him. What was the name of the flick? Um, it's like, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, it was yeah. not one of their better films. 
Yeah. And we start getting all these texts. You got to get out to Liberty Lounge. Oh, you got to get out to La Zona Rosa. Bill Murray just jumped behind the bar and standing bar. And both of us looking at our phones going, there's no way, because we were staying at a friend's house north of town. There was no way we were going to get there in time. And you can't right. park anywhere and just walk into a joint in Austin. It doesn't happen on 6th Street. Just doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, not to mention the fact that by the time we got to the bar that he was tending bar at, he would have already hit like three other bars. There's no way that you could have caught up to him unless you were there and followed him to the next bar. It's like Santa so, watch. You can see yeah. the dot moving up 6th Street. <laughs> and and my favorite my favorite part of that story, which we've actually heard stories similar to this since then, basically from the sound of it, Bill Murray was walking into these bars and he was just jumping behind the bar and starting to serve drinks and they didn't stop him. Like, Not only that, but regardless of what you asked him for, you got tequila. Right, exactly. You could ask, uh, you give, could me, give me a rum and coke, he'd give you some tequila. Uh, give me a uh, Tom Collins, give me your tequila. Give me an old fashioned, here's some tequila. And you, and that was it. And you took it because Bill Murray poured it for you. <laughs> yeah. Was the movie, uh, Was it, I'm trying to think of what the movie was. It wasn't Get Low, was it? Yes. Yes, it was. was. It yes, low? that was it. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we, we can't even joke about having our own little private South by experience here because we're still not inoculated yet. You still haven't had your injections. I'll have mine in, but you know, you're, you're still a plague victim. So I can't, I can't hang around you till this is over. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Speaking of plague victims, Disney had their quarterly call <laughs> this year. And all of our work for segways goes down the drain. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, I did the best I could. Disney had their quarterly call this year. A couple of things that we learned from the quarterly call. Uh, they are still planning at this point to release Marvel Studios Black Widow in theaters. Ugh. I just don't know how that's going to work, but uh, evidently they are trying to do it this May, do a theatrical release of Black Widow which, safe to say, one of their most anticipated films would be the first Marvel Studios movie released in since, over a year. Since Spider-Man Far From Home, which technically isn't a Marvel Studios movie, but uh, a sense of Avengers Endgame, I guess you could say. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a while since we've seen a Marvel movie on the big screen. But the question remains, are people going to go watch this movie in a theater or are they going to try to wait until it hits streaming? I think a lot of people are kind of programmed to wait for streaming right about now. And, which this kind of feeds directly into that, Disney Plus now has officially 94.3 million subscribers, which is second only to Netflix. So a lot of people that were questioning, is Disney Plus going to be a formidable adversary to something like, say, Netflix? I think now we have our answer. Yes, they are going to be a formidable adversary to something like Netflix. They they are very quickly becoming one of the hottest streaming services out there. There were a lot of people who were looking at the bundle pieces to Disney+. Plus. Um, right now, their per-user revenue is sitting at about four and a half bucks, mm -hmm. which, you know, that it's really driven down if you've gotten the... Uh, the package deal or a free 90 day trial or whatever. It's going to be really interesting. Once those start to taper off, if that number comes up, if the subscriber number comes down and just trying to figure out where they sit in the big ecosystem. But right now um, you're, you're finally getting stuff on Disney plus that, I mean, they, they've always had stuff like the world according to Jeff Goldblum, which is still one of my favorite shows of 2020. Um, We've had two seasons of Mandalorian. We're in the midst of WandaVision right now. And it just, it, 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 it floors me that as deep of a catalog as they have, because it's damn near every single film that Disney's put out. Um, do they, are the Touchstone films on there or no? I, I, I keep thinking that they're not because they're adult content and they're kind of shying away from that bit of it. Yeah, I don't think they're on there yet, but I think there was talk about that because I, I know that, because of the whole Fox merger and there was a lot of question of, okay, well, so what does Disney do with like, say the diehard movies or the alien movies and things like that? I have a feeling one of two things is going to happen. Either Disney plus subscribers are going to be offered an additional add on side service that will be uh, kind of like, kind of like Disney, like Dis Disney after dark, Devin, 
you know, something along those lines. But it'll be something, something probably creepy and weird. Uh, or, or maybe what they should do is start a new streaming service and have it be the Touchstone streaming service. Oh, great! Have- Another streaming service. <laughs> Yay! But either so way, happy. but Yay. either way, I think it should be offered as a nominal additional fee add-on for Disney Plus subscribers. First, I don't think they should just start another streaming service and say, well, here it is, add it if you want. I think that it should be offered at least as some kind of an add-on package. And then, of course, if anybody else wants to just subscribe to that and not Disney+, Plus, they ha- they would have that option as well. I think that's the only thing that makes sense at this point. All I know is that when we're looking, if you look at the reasons why you cut the cords to begin with, and, and I've been... I've been somebody who has gotten away from cable. I I cut the cord in 2009, mm-hmm. and I would review these services. I, I wrote columns about it, and it's now gotten to the point where it's more expensive to cut the cord if you want to see all this content than it would be if you had a full ride cable or dish subscription. It's 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 beyond stupid, and yeah. it, it's 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 it, I, I I blame. Disney Plus and I blame HBO Max for both of these because yeah. I mean if you want to be relevant if you want to be that fan who hears the stuff about WandaVision first or The Mandalorian or um oh god strange not strange new worlds uh the stranger uh, the, things no the Ridley Scott show um oh oh uh, yeah yeah I know Raised by Wolves yeah yeah Raised um, by Wolves. which I mean all these shows you have to stay relevant to them or you'll you know be, be behind the curve. They'll be spoiled for you, whatever the case may be. So either you pirate them or you plunk down the money. Either way. All right, let's move on. Okay. Um, we've heard rumblings over the years about Joss Whedon. He was accused of abuse by a former spouse. Last year, um, he had very public... Um, accusations about his behavior on set by Ray Fisher, who played Cyborg in Justice League, where he came over and took over the production of that movie when Zack Snyder had to step away from it. Prompted a full-blown investigation. A by full-blown Warner. investigation, which, of yeah. course, Warner Brothers comes back and says, eh, didn't really have a problem. Ray Fisher, of course, blasts Warner Brothers for that as well. This week, yeah. Charisma Carpenter, after 20-some-odd years of being intimately involved with Joss's signature franchises, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel, comes out and says he was an absolute tyrant and abuses of power when she worked with him. Uh, I'm going to quote from a statement that she posted to Twitter. Joss has a history of being casually cruel. He's created hostile and toxic work environments since his early career. I know it because I experienced it firsthand repeatedly. In a new statement, uh, she said that if she was going to keep going to keep it when she was expecting a baby and then accused her of sabotaging Angel in the middle of the production and she starts having Braxton Hicks attractions because of the stress of it and Joss only conceded to make it worse. Charisma comes out with this and within 48 hours, nearly every other female co-star the Charisma's had over that run of Buffy and Angel, not only said she is 100% accurate and it might be understating it, if anything, but it might even be worse than that. Let's take a look at Michelle Trachtenberg, who played Buffy's younger sister on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There was a rule on the set of Buffy the Vampire Slayer saying Joss Whedon was not allowed in a room with Michelle again, full stop, because of his tyrannic ways. Then Sarah Michelle Geller posts after Charisma comes out saying, and I quote, while I am proud to have my name associated with Buffy Summers, I don't want to be forever associated with the name Joss Whedon. I will not be making any further statements at this time, but I stand with all the survivors of abuse and I'm proud of them for speaking out. This from somebody who made his bones, not just as a unique storyteller, but as a champion of feminism to the point where I was involved with a charity that was launched to raise money for the organization that his mother uh, co-founded, Equality Now, Mm -hmm. based on Joss's work and his outspoken views 
towards the way that women are uh, portrayed in film and television. Watching these notes come out and just completely, you know, there's no denying it. I mean, when his when his ex-wife came out with the notes, it was it was skeevy enough. Believe women when they make the statements, believe them because they're not doing it for attention. It makes it infinitely worse for each and every person. Always believe them. Yeah. Until proven otherwise. And with this bunch of stuff, the Ray Fisher stuff always seemed like there was another side of the story, but we weren't always hearing it. And now it's just like, okay, not only was Ray right, but there's no way he's going to work again in this town. He's yeah. already had his name taken off of all the press materials for the HBO Max series that's coming out later this year called The Nevers. It's going to be very weird to promote that show because he's still going to have executive producer credits on it due to Guild rules. Mm-hmm. But he's not going to be involved in any of the production. He was he was he left it midstream. It's still going to be coming out later this year. But it's not Joss Whedon's The Nevers anymore. It's just The Nevers. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, it's upsetting in a lot of ways, I think, especially because uh, guys like us, uh, you know, we 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 kind of came into our own while this guy was, you know, this guy was pop culture, you know, for the last 20 years and at least. And, and you know, I mean, he was basically, we would go to conventions, we would see him, you know, he would come on screen and panels and people would lose their minds. I mean, this guy was like a hero to all pop culture fans. And so to have something like this happen, uh, you know, and come out, this kind of information come out, it is rather devastating. And I think it's going to it's going to have people reevaluate a lot of things. You know, we're we're seeing a lot of consequence take place, especially now in 2021. We're seeing a lot of people having to kind of pay for their crimes and things that got swept under the table are coming into the light. And I don't think this is anywhere near the end of this. I think we're going to see a lot more of this, but it is very unfortunate because I think it, it tarnishes, it tarnishes a major legacy, not just Buffy, but you know, Firefly and all the other things that Joss Whedon was involved with the Avengers movies. I mean, people are going to start looking at a lot of things very differently now. So it's a tremendous shame that, that, what is coming to light is coming to light, but it is also extremely necessary and long overdue. And uh, I kind of, I can't help but applaud the people like Chris McCartner and Sarah Michelle Geller, even though she didn't necessarily speak out against him. The fact that she is standing with the women who did, I, I applaud them for doing that because they're taking a big risk by doing so. And, uh, but I, I do feel like we're going to see a lot more of this. You and I have both um, had long conversations with Charisma over the years. Mm-hmm. And there was always a deflection. I went back and looked at a conversation we had uh, in 2010 together. It was an hour-long panel. Mm-hmm. And she spoke about her work. She spoke about working with uh, folks like David Boreanaz. But when it came to talking about Joss, there was always this hesitation to lionize him and now it makes perfect sense yeah yeah it it is interesting when you think about it there you know there were some people i think a lot of fans had a tendency to kind of put him on a pedestal and think i'm guilty of it i'm totally guilty of it i i I in a way am too even though i wasn't necessarily a buffy fan once i kind of got into firefly i was like oh my god this guy's a genius you know and i i was very quick to laud him you know and and tell people how great I thought he was and how smart I thought he was. And listen, he was, I mean, let's face it, the stuff that he created, the stuff that he produced, it was good. But once you find out about the darker side of somebody, it does get really hard to separate the artist from the art. And in this particular instance, to find out some of the things that he had been doing. And I don't think we even really have scratched the surface with this. I think a lot more is going to come out about this and, and the worst may be yet to come. But the weird thing thing is going to be when you have a body of work like this, it takes more to seep into your brain that it's actually, you know, that it's happening. And then you need to not keep this person on that level. If you don't have a large body of work like Joss, you don't get that luxury. Yeah. Well, and I guess this kind of feeds into the next thing we're going to talk about, which is on a lot of people's lips this week. 
and that is Gina Carano uh, being freshly fired from The Mandalorian. Well, and, and here's the thing. That's the report that's coming out. Like a lot of people are saying she has been fired. I don't know that there's really been any official confirmation that she has been fired. Just that Disney put out a statement that said she is not currently employed by Disney and or Lucasfilm. So that would imply that she's very likely not coming back for The Mandalorian. Now, in case anybody is living under a rock and hasn't read any of the thousand news stories that have come out about this, the reasoning behind this is because Gina Carano has posted some rather controversial things on Twitter, uh, things that include like anti-trans rhetoric, anti-masker rhetoric, you know, voter fraud, conspiracy theory, uh, things like that. And then her one of her most recent posts was comparing criticism of Republicans to the Jews during the Holocaust. Including no, to, 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 to Nazis during Nazis, World War II. Yes, and Jews being, you know, hurt during the Holocaust, and including pictures. She decided to tweet this out. Now, listen, regardless of what side you're on, at some point you have to kind of think twice before you post something. And Gina Carano had already been warned multiple times by Disney, by higher ups, by people who, by her own cast members, like people that were saying like, hey, maybe take it down a notch on Twitter, like unless you don't want to work here anymore. And rather than apologize or show even an ounce of remorse, every single time she doubled down and she just basically made it worse. So here we are, Gina Carano, for what we can tell, is no longer employed on The Mandalorian. And it's splitting people into two very different camps. The people that are like, okay, yeah, makes sense. Good riddance. Like, you brought it on yourself. Um, and listen, I'll admit, I was a Gina Carano fan. I thought she was really cool. I, I, I liked her for many, many years. I thought she was great. But when I started seeing some of the stuff that she was posting on social media, it very much changed my opinion of her. And I thought, maybe she's not the person I thought she was. And I think a lot of people are seeing that now. But what's happening is it's splitting people up and some people are trying to side with her and say that this is a very extreme reaction and it's over the top, it's over the line. And other people are saying, no, she brought this on herself. And what really aggravates me is that a lot of people are trying to make it political. They're trying to turn her into a political martyr. And I don't think this is about politics. I think this goes into morality. This goes into ethics. This goes into the same kind of category when you would discuss if you're working at a grocery store and you're saying controversial things in the break room, don't be surprised when they fire you. Well, that's Twitter is the break room at Disney. And so if you're going to say stuff on Twitter where the whole everyone in public can read it and see what you have to say, you better think twice about what you're saying on Twitter. And that's not censorship. That's ethics is what that is. And, and I think what we're seeing here again 2021 this is the year of consequence words have consequences and she's learning that the hard way couple of uh clarifications disney's actual statement says that gina carano has not been under our employ for some time right what that doesn't say is that the last episode of the mandalorian sets up one of the series that was brought up in the Disney investor uh, meeting in November, where they rolled out 19,000 Star Wars projects that are going to be coming out over the decade. And this one is Rangers of the New Republic. They spent the back half of that last episode of Mandalorian setting Gina Carano up to be the lead for this show. They were getting ready to roll her out as the star in that investor meeting in November. Then everything blew up with her social media presence. Disney pulled back and just said, we're going to announce the show and we're not going to mention Gina at all. And if you look at the tape or the video, whatever the file, <laughs> she's not mentioned anywhere in it whatsoever. So on that plus, and my first reaction was, I wonder what her agent is thinking right now. And then immediately uh, our buddy John Wildman messaged me saying, well, they think a lot of it because UTC or say UTA just fired her. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you look at all of that and, oh man, it, it, 
I don't know why anybody is surprised by this. I mean, to me, it's it's kind of like when you run into a crowded building and you scream fire. If there's no fire, then yeah, people are going to be angry with you. And and basically, the reactions that are happening to her are based off of things that she posted very publicly that were controversial. She never apologized. She never showed remorse for it. I mean, at least if she had apologized and said, hey, you know what? My bad. I shouldn't have said that. I feel bad. I realized it offended some people. And so I hope everybody, I hope you'll give me a second chance. At least if there had been something like that, then you could have used that defense to say, well, clearly she understood that she made a mistake. She's never done that. She's never shown an ounce of remorse for anything that she posted, which means she stands by it. Well, that's fine. If you want to stand by it, you have the freedom to say whatever you want but you also have to accept the consequences of those words. All right. We're, we're running low on time. Actually, we're a little over on time. Yeah, we're a little uh, over the, that, No, that's fine. We, we both went off on rants on this. It's fine. Yeah. That, that it's, it's the rap party. That's what it happens. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring up one piece that, of news that both Mark and I were saying going, really, this is happening now? Um, the 1995 film True Lies, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tom Arnold. Uh, oh, God. And we were just talking about the... Oh, well, Jamie Lee too. Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis, Eliza obviously. Dushku. Eliza, Eliza Dushku. Dushku. That a, very was the young, one. a very young Eliza Dushku. Obviously, way pre uh, the work yeah. that she did on Buffy. Um, and ain't, did she show up in Angel? Yes, yeah, for like a week. Anyway, this has been rumored to be getting a TV series or a reboot or a sequel since 1996, the year after the film came out, I still hold this as one of James Cameron's three best films. It's it's an absolute favorite of mine. And now, after all of that, we might actually be seeing the TV series. Matt Nix, who did Burn Notice, who I actually love. Uh, also, um, the series Run of the Good Guys, which shot here in Dallas, so I have an automatic affinity for him. He is writing a pilot script, which is going to be directed by McG and executive produced by James Cameron. It's not, a, it's not a rumor. Oh, I hate you so much. I've been saving <laughs> that. I've been saving that. It's not a rumor. It's not. So we'll see if this actually comes to fruition or not. I'm. Um, there's no note on casting whatsoever, just that the, uh, the thing is underway in, in pre-production. Who knows if we're actually going to see it? I want to see it. I can't wait. I, I hope we see it, and I hope they do it justice. If anybody's going to do it justice, it'll be Matt and Nick's, because Burn Notice is right in that same uh, narrative style as what True Lies had. So I think it's a good fit. Well, and let's face it, Arnold is kind of reaching an age now where uh, it's probably easier for him to maybe do a you know recurring starring, recurring guest star role on a TV show than to try to make a big budget movie. It's probably easier. So it's very possible he could appear in like a supporting role, you know, playing the character that we saw him play in the films, but not no, necessarily. No, 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 no. He is in the role that Charlton Heston was in right. in True <laughs> Lies, where he's heading up the Omega Agency. Sweet Jesus, Harry, you certainly screwed the pooch on this one, didn't you? <laughs> oh my God. I so think that is, that, that's the first, that's his first line in the movie is, is when he shows up. And that, yeah, I love that film. I really love that film. And I agree with you. I think it's one of Cameron's best films. All right. So uh, thank you very much for watching The Rap Party. Uh, coming up on Tuesday, as I was mentioning earlier, we have reviews of two new films that you'll be hearing a lot about in the coming review season, Nomadland and Minari. And yes. Mark, just, he's just going to nod his head like a nodding. No, I, I, I love both of these movies. I'm very excited to talk about them. And I think that uh, I really hope people get a chance to see these, especially because coming up for award time, as we mentioned, these are two movies you're going to be hearing a lot more about. So we will uh, we'll be telling you everything you need to know about those. And uh, yeah, we got a lot more coming on the big film show. As always, we want you to be a part of the show. If you have any notes on any of the things that we've talked about, or any of the films that we review, shoot us a note at hey at bigfilmshow.com and follow all of our social channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever the case may be, it's Big Film Show. That's right. Thank you for joining us on this week's uh, episode for the news recap. We went a little bit long this week, but hey, uh, we thought it was a slow news week and it turned into a kind of a full show. So how about that? There are My journalism prof told me this and I completely under, I believe it. There's no such thing as slow news weeks there's only slow news people. And I'm a slow people. 
<laughs> We're both slow people. It's too cold to be active tonight. My God. We were we're in we're in Dallas and it's twenty three degrees. That's is not the reason why I live in this state. That's Devin Pike. That's Mark Walters. <laughs> you know, pointed in the right direction. I, I so pointed proud. the right way. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching and subscribing. Uh, please do so if you've not already subscribed yet with all of your favorite podcast services or over on YouTube on the channel The Big Film Show. Thank you very much for watching. That is Mark Walters. That's Devin Pike again. We will see you on Tuesday with another episode of The Big Film Show. Thank you very much and have a safe and wonderful weekend. We'll see you at the movies. Take care. For more information on episodes, subscription links, or where to watch the films discussed on this podcast, please visit our companion site, bigfilmshow.com. All rights reserved by the original rights holders, and the display of any material from previously released works are for the sole purpose of promotion of said works. Want to be a part of the Big Film Show? Great, we want that as well. Send an email to hey at bigfilmshow.com. The Big Film Show is a Bacon Samurai production. Jesus, Mark, you really screwed the pooch on that one. Sweet Jesus, Harry, you certainly screwed the pooch on that one, did you?